Good evening, listeners, brave navigators of the enigmatic and the concealed. Have you ever felt the pull of the unanswered, the allure of the mysteries that shroud our existence? For more than a decade, a unique comic publisher has dared to dive into these mysteries, unafraid of the secrets they might uncover. This audacious entity is Paranoid American. Welcome to the mystifying universe of the Paranoid American podcast. Launched in the year 2012, Paranoid American has been on a mission to decipher the encrypted secrets of our world. From the unnerving enigma of MK Ultra mind control to the clandestine assemblies of secret societies. From the awe-inspiring frontiers of forbidden technology to the arcane patterns of occult symbols in our very own pop culture. They have committed to unveiling the concealed realities that lie just beneath the surface. Join us as we navigate these intricate landscapes, decoding the hidden scripts of our society and challenging the accepted perceptions of reality. Folks, I've got a big problem on my hands. There's a company called Paranoid American making all these funny memes and comics. Now, I'm a fair guy. I believe in free speech uh, as long as it doesn't cross the line. And if these AI-generated memes dare to make fun of me, they're crossing the line. This is your expedition into the realm of the extraordinary, the secret, the shrouded. Come with us as we sift through the world's grand mysteries, question the standardized narratives, and brave the cryptic labyrinth of the concealed truth. So strap yourselves in, broaden your horizons, and steel yourselves for a voyage into the enigmatic heart of the paranoid American podcast, where each story, every image, every revelation brings us one step closer to the elusive truth. Hey, it's another episode of Paranoid American Podcast, and today uh, I've got a guest named Robert Stewart from Afterburner Comics, and I was just telling Robert, there he is, front and center, uh, that when I first joined Instagram, here, we'll, we'll, we'll stick you up on the, the middle for a little bit here, let people bask in, in your glory. When I first joined Instagram a few years ago, um, I was like a baby into social media, and Robert was one of the very first accounts that I followed. And ever since then, I've, I've kind of like, I was joking, I've seen like your whole journey, but I realized that the journey goes way more than whatever two years or three years uh, that gets posted on social media. But by I mean that is like, I don't think we've ever spoken or talked before. We might have like texted back and forth a, a couple yes. times but like i've seen you post you know in music and at releases and uh like posting comics and and more in particular is like it looks like you're hustling out there man you're hitting the streets you're going into local comic shops you're getting your books placed you're taking pictures of like here's my book here it is in this shop here's the shop uh and i love that because like i understand a large part of that and it's not the the easiest thing in the world to do uh, and it doesn't just automatically happen. It's one of these like really. So anyways, before we get all deep and dirty into like the, the business of comics, uh, welcome to the show, Robert. And please let anyone know where they can find uh, your stuff. Afterburner Comics, uh, Tales of the Cool and Wicked. Right. I got that right. Uh, where That's they can correct. find everything. Hi, everyone. Tom, thank you very much for having me on the show. And um, as Tom said, I'm Robert Stewart from Afterburner Comics. I'm the writer, the artist and the publisher. Uh, you can find my works at. Um, the website afterburnercomics.com and you can follow me on Instagram at afterburnercomics. So, and your, your main title, um, where did this come from? I, I want to just jump right into tales of the wicked and cool. Where, like, where was the inspiration you're on volume? What, like seven or eight at this point? Yeah, I'm, um, I've got number 10 coming up and, uh, the title is, uh, afterburner tales of the cool and the wicked. And, um, as far as the title, um, a lot of it comes from um, my military background. I was in the Navy before, so I was always around, you know, seeing the the uh, the F-14 planes flying around. And when I came up with the name for my comic series, I wanted something that that kind of gave the connection to, um, you know, action and something moving forward. And so to me, it was natural to uh, to use the name Afterburner. And the subtitle of Tales of the Cool and the Wicked, for me, that's kind of the most important part of the title and kind of the core of the series, the core, um, the core anthem of the series, so to speak, in that 
the tales that I'm telling in Afterburner are very much related to film noir. And if you're familiar with the film noir genre, a lot of film noir was that you'd have these really, you know, cool settings and, you know, um, you know, these long, dark shadows and, you know, these private eyes that were, um, you know, maybe intermingling with, say, like with the um, someone like Lou Archer, the private eye of Lou Archer. He was in, L- in L.A., but a lot of times he would spend a lot of his time in, you know, Beverly Hills or, you know, these really posh places where from the outside, everything looked really cool and attainable. But once you got within the realms of those areas, you start to see some of the more, I guess, some of the more, um, some of the more darker areas of where they were, uh, whether it was from a mindset or just for their intents and purposes. And for in the, um, in the sense of afterburner, I kind of leave it up to the to the reader to decide which of the characters is, you know, kind of a cool person, and which of them has wicked intentions. Uh, so I I think I know what film noir is, but I honestly, if you, if this was like a pop quiz, I'd probably get like a D or a C, like I might get a passing <laughs> grade, but but I, my mind goes right to kind of as you're describing it, um, that like that gumshoe or like that, that Dick Tracy almost style detective with like the swinging lamp and like the, the broad or the dame that shows up and needs help. Is this what we're, are we talking like Roger rabbit, um, sort of era? <laughs> um, I, I, I would imagine that Roger rabbit would be, um, <laughs> well, the, the detective from Roger rabbit, I <laughs> right, right. Eddie, uh-huh. Eddie. <laughs> so, um, so for that, that's right. The, the detective in Roger Rabbit and that entire, um, I guess the, the entire film world of Roger Rabbit was kind of inspired by film noir. When we're looking at film noir, it's more of a genre that, um, that tends to have certain elements to it. A lot of it is um, the setting. When I say the setting, I mean things like the lighting. Um, you'll have these, um, uh, these lots of shadows, um, Shadows in the the environment and also the intents of the of the characters. So, from a modern perspective, it's something that I could um, describe to you that would be a good example of film noir. Would be something like, um, oh, oh, I'm trying. I'm kind of blanking on on modern perspectives. Um, I think things like I can recommend you something like uh, Double Indemnity that had Barbara Steinwick and Fred McMurray. So that's a very famous uh, movie that would have probably just a classic film noir um, type of setting. And also um, from comics, I think the the prominent book from comics would be um, The Spirit with Will Eisner. If you look at Will Eisner's spirit, um, just his layouts, his pacing, um, the film fatales. Film fatales are an important part of film noir, um, and I think that again, the 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 textbook from that is is uh, is Will Eisner. Look at Will Eisner's spirit, and from Will Eisner's spirit, you see the connections to um, Frank Miller's Sin City, and in a film uh, film media, then look at stuff from say, I would put. Quentin Tarantino stuff into the film noir category. Also something from um, Michael Mann. If you saw the movie with Tom Cruise and Jamie Foxx, was that collateral? Uh, I believe so. It was when when, uh, Tom Cruise had like dyed hair or something. Yes. Yes. So I would put that in the film noir category. I would put, um, Oh, of course, LA confidential uh, a couple of years ago with Russell Crowe, but some of the the main elements that you're going to see in film noir are going to be characters that are duplicitous. So they'll have, um, they'll state one objective, but they've actually got an underlying objective to whatever their cause is. And also you'll see, as I say, the, these, um, uh, the, the world environment is almost a character in itself in film noir. And, Film noir, you have to have a film fatale. 
is it's, it's, it's essential. And I think that's especially essential in today's environment when we look at um, how we're or how mainstream media is trying to incorporate a lot of different people and characters into storylines. Um, I think film noir shows a strong template for a very effective way of how that can be done. Uh, because when you look at the classic film fatale, um, on the surface, they may seem like, um, you know, like they're, they're just a passenger in the narrative. But as the story progresses in a film, in a, in a film noir story, it becomes very clear that the film fatale is actually the driver. The film fatale um, is actually um, a lot of times um, the mastermind behind the the events of the story. And there's a subtlety there. And I think that plays in well to the different dynamics of um, as people of it, as individuals, um, how we all use our our own innate strengths to to progress as opposed to trying to copy um, the strengths of someone else that do, that doesn't work very well uh, we have to play with our own field and play with play on our own strengths um, comic book terms think of the difference between say um, Batman and Superman two very different individuals from a mindset from a purpose from a goal and from a power set but very effective in using the tools that they have. Um, and that was a bit of digression, but I'm trying to connect the, the points um, and uh, show the relationships between um, the film media and the sequential narrative of comics. Uh, I like that. I actually, I guess in my, in my own bumpkin mind, I never really considered that film noir, like I understand the shadows and some of like the monochromatic aspect. And even yeah. when you describe the environment as a character, I get all that, but I guess I had never until you just sort of explained it in a really great way that the, the ambiguity of intention of every character is almost like this other trait. And just like the aesthetics are shadowy, it's almost like you take that same shadowy aesthetic and apply it to the story itself and the characters themselves, which is a really cool. Cause now that I'm going through all the old noir movies, it is like every single character. You're always like, they're up to something like they're plotting yes. <laughs> something. And the, it's a really good about the femme fatale too. And I realized just like film noir, I think I know what a femme fatale is, but like, <laughs> is there a checklist? Like if, if there's a movie, like a film noir movie comes on and Robert's watching it, you've never right. seen it before. Right? right. Uh, and let's just say it's called the femme fatale, but like right. they open and there's 10 different ladies that get revealed. Like, what are you looking at to be like, okay, she's not the femme fatale because of X, Y, Z. She might be it because of, so let, let me just throw one out there. Like if they wear their heart on their sleeve and there's no ambiguity, <laughs> does that make them more like, Oh no, they're definitely the femme fatale. They're definitely hiding something. Or and I, I say that in jest because it's not no, like I there's a golden the, rule, but I, I think the one thing that I look for is, are they cool under pressure? Um, when, if, um, there's a, I, I'm going back again, there was a movie called, um, I believe it was to have and to have not. And that was Humphrey Bogart and Warren Bacall's, uh, first meeting. I, I believe that's, I believe that was uh, to have and to have not, um, probably 19. 19- 47 1948 something like that Laura bacall also played a witch uh on a, on a few movies she was like the the witch wife i think, I think yeah so. i might i might be wrong on that <laughs> yes. but it would like yes. she was one of the, the classic uh sort of like film noir actresses of the era right right and uh one of the things that i um i always look for some from theirs so there's two there's two sides of film uh to the film fatale sometimes there's they're using soft energy. And I think um, Lauren Bacall, especially in To Have and To Have Not, was very good at using soft energy in that she projected um, almost a, a, a very a very soft feminine side, but there's an incident where one of the one of the goons, one of the thugs, 
um, wants some information and he slaps her and she, do, it doesn't phase her. I mean, she just, she takes the hit and, and, and keeps going with whatever she's doing. Um, in that movie, she's more of a, um, a compliment to the Bogart character. The Bogart character in that movie is the, is the true film noir protagonist, but her actions, her, um, her demeanor in that movie gave the, the strength that a film fatale would have. Now, on the flip side, the other movie that I was discussing earlier, um, Double Indemnity, and that had Barbara Steinwick in it. And she, Barbara Steinwick in that movie is, is projecting a, um, again, we were talking soft energy, Barbara Steinwick is projecting a hard energy uh, in that movie. She is clearly being manipulative. Um, she's clearly using her her femininity. She's clearly using sex as a way of manipulating and getting what she wants. Um, there's there's a line that I use that's kind of inspired by those several things in, I believe it's in the first. Uh, no, I think it's after burner number four where one of my lead characters, uh, Arizona Dos Santos, tells a guy, she says, I use what I have to get what I want or get, get, to get what I need. So there is a, a film that tell will have um, a lot of practicality. Number one, she will be unfazed. If there's gunfire going off, the film fatale is kind of like, hey, been there, done that. I've seen this before. Let's move on. Let's do whatever we need to do. And also there is a practicality from the femme fatale in that she does what she needs to do in order to 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 meet her to, to meet her goals, whether that's a business goal, whether that's to um, you know manipulate some muscle bound guy to to do the leg work and the hard work for her to go in and you know beat up some gangsters so that she can get away with the with the gold. <laughs> um, there's just a different way that the femme fatale will use that you will see that she is projecting power without being, um, you know, without flexing, you know, without flexing her muscles or brandishing a gun or something like that. The femme fatale will use a more, a more strategic method of achieving her goals. And once you are looking at say a movie or a, or reading a, a story and you see a, and you're trying to establish, we're, we're talking about trying to establish who the femme fatale is. When you see the individual, you know, in this case, we're saying femme fatale stuff is when you're seeing the woman that is very cool under pressure. And um, again, when you see that she's making strategic moves, she's doing things very strategically <clears throat> as far as uh, setting the other characters up, like, like, um, like, like pieces on a chessboard, that's your femme fatale. Does this mean that the femme fatale um, has to be intelligent always? Like, could you have a dumb femme fatale, or would that not work? You could, but just the nature of being a femme fatale, the 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 nature of it in itself points to a very tactical mindset, and I think that some people can have a an innate um, tactical mindset, but it, it usually comes with 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 something a little uh, something a little bit more behind the um, behind the outward appearance. And it, it seems too that just within the genre of noir that ambiguity would apply to almost every facet of someone's personality. So it, it would be really hard to say like this person is um, like just absolute good. And this person's absolute bad. Although usually you can tell who's the good guy and the bad guy in a, like a, in a movie sense, like you're rooting for the detective to catch the evil gangster or something. And they might both be in gray area, but it right. seems for the convenience of a story and to have all the beats and everything. So with, with, with that kind of context in mind is a femme fatale. Do they necessarily end up as good guy or bad guy? Or are they traditionally neutral? Does it just uh, vary on the story or is there, is there something specific to a femme fatale that always puts them more towards one category than the other? 
Um, I think it depends on the story and within the and on the story context. Um, and depending on we, as depending on us as a viewer, uh, depending on our on past experiences and what we're bringing into our viewing of the narrative, then that's going to play a lot into how we perceive, um, you know, the actions of, of the protagonists. So, you know, maybe we've had a bad experience with, you know, the diner going, going to a diner and, and getting served a bad meal and then being overcharged for it. And so if the femme fatale wants to, uh, if her goal is to rob a diner, then, you know, we're going to cheer for that. And we're going to say, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, she's, <laughs> she's not a bad person. She's just, you know, um, trying to, trying to get a, a better position in, in, you know, in her situation. But on the that, other hand, that sounded very specific. Is is there a certain diner that you want to call out right now? Do we want to throw no, some shots? No, I'm just kidding. No, no, not at all. Um, that's simply again. I, I try to I try to make analogies that that can clearly uh, that I can that I can um, form connections between an analogy that people in general have had an experience with, and then connect that to. Um, whatever the point of the discussion is, whether it's comics, whether it's film, whether it's music. Okay. I like that. Now it was a great analogy because now the viewer has some bias that plays into it. And I did, I guess I would assume too, that the nature of a femme fatale being tactical and self-serving is that if their end goal happens to align with the protagonist, well then she's a good guy in that movie. But if right. it happened to vary, if like, if for example, if, if they share the same interest, except for hers, changes a little bit like they both want the gold but the tweak is that she wants to keep it at the end uh, right. that might be different and there's so many of those movies too where i guess the femme fatale um you're put into that situation where it's like they can either give the gold to the protagonist and be like you know normally i'd steal this but you're the real one you know i, I actually love you this time but if that ever happens it, it almost <laughs> like takes all that power away and it's like if you're gonna fall for indiana jones or if you're gonna fall for james bond or fill in the blank how did you even get this far like how did you get to the final level right. if you're so susceptible to that so to piggyback on that is yeah. every one of james bond love interests a femme fatale um i don't think so no i i i, I don't think it's his, his uh the the uh the 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 female characters in the in the james bond franchise i would not i'm trying is that because think. it's outside of the noir or is there something specific about them that that like you know takes them out of the running of being femme fatales um I think the, because the only the only two that because usually and, and and understandably this is part of the you know this is part and partial for the James Bond franchise um, and the and um, you know just the, the storyline of the storyline is that James Bond is the is the protagonist but I think um, the only two that I can readily think of right now would be um, Maude Adams. I think Maude Adams was Octopussy with, in the movie, uh, one, that was one of the Roger Moore movies. And she actually turned out being, I think she actually turned out being kind of like a double agent or, or she had nefarious, you know, nefarious plans. Um, but she was pretending to be someone else. So I think she was probably the closest to being a femme fatale because she used all of the resources that she had around her, including James Bond, um, to 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 get her goal of I think she was trying to go G O A L of um, I think she was trying to get revenge on someone who killed her family. And the other one that I can think of was um, in Golden Eye. Was it? I think it was Golden Eye with Pierce Bronson, and um, I believe that was Fran Fran Johnson. She played. Jean Grey in one of the X-Men movies. Um, she was a a very formidable villain in that movie, but that was her, you know, that, that was her gig. Being the villain was the gig. She was the heavy. And she didn't have a a turn point or any point in the film where um, 
she decided that, you know, she's going to, she's going to uh, save the cat and save the cat as a reference to um, a, a film instruction series that one of the main ways that you want to have your audience connect with your protagonist is to, the, the title of the, 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 the series is Save the Cat. You want to have them um, in a metaphor. In, in, in a, as a metaphor, you want them to save the cat or sh- have them show some type of, no matter how hard the character is, at some point in the film or in the book, you want to have them show some type of empathy um, for someone that's weaker than them or some object, you know, that's weaker than them. And in um, in Golden Eye, that character never Anna on the top. She never had that that type of um, th- that type of scene. So I really can't think of other than Maude Adams in um, in Octopussy. I can't think of any other uh, James Bond uh, female that that had that type of um, film uh, film fatale, classic film fatale um, type of character arc. I like I like that rule. I haven't heard that before. Save the cat, but basically have a character show some sort of altruism, like just complete, you know, to the benefit of someone other than themselves. And with, with you said specifically someone weaker than them, because then it would be true altruism. Cause I guess if you do something nice for someone more powerful than you, then it could always be contrived as being some sort of like a self-serving thing. But if it's for someone right. weaker and it's just like passing by, you just save a cat from a tree or whatever. Exactly. Uh, I like that. That's a that's a great little yeah. cheat code of like you know build some empathy for this random character. Right. What about mod? Like, what's a, a modern version of a femme fatale? Is there any like movie you've seen recently in the last couple of years that maybe wasn't classically made to be you know a noir style femme fatale, but it's like that character is the femme fatale in this context? Um, it's really difficult from from a modern standpoint because. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, I think that modern, um, writers have a different concept on, on power projection. And, um, I, I think they're still trying to reinvent the genre. So they don't understand, um, or I shouldn't say they don't understand because if they've re- if if they if a writer has reached a level where they're you know working on a you know on a, on a multi million dollar film project, I would like to think that at least two or three people in the room have some um, some formal training in 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 character development. But I think I think they're trying to reinvent a genre and it's taking them a while to get things correct uh, or or to course correct. And so they don't, they, they, they don't understand how to build a film fatale because unfortunately they don't understand the differences in how power can exist. It's that thing that we were saying before between the difference between say Superman and Batman. Um, If you only see power as being able to lift up heavy things and, you know, fly and throw shoot lasers. If you can't shoot lasers, then what are we even doing here? <laughs> right. But in, in that case, but if you've got Superman and Batman in the room together, Batman is the most dangerous person in that room. And, but you know, the, 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 he's using a different skill set, a different power skill set. And I think as an audience, we can recognize that. Um, and as writers, modern day writers, I think they, they can recognize things on that level that, okay, um, Batman's the most uh, dangerous guy in that, in that scenario. Does that mean he wins? Does that mean Batman versus Superman locked in a room? Batman wins that fight? And again, that, that comes from the classic thing. Has he has he been? Did he have time to prepare? And if he's had time to prepare, and the whole essence, of especially the modern day take on Batman, is that yeah, this guy's he's already prepared. Um, the same thing if you see um, from you know Batman and Superman are are, are the um, 
of the, the DC examples, but if you go to the Marvel side of things, um, you know, the the common thing for, for the Black Panther right now is that T'Challa is the most dangerous man alive. Um, but, you know, without the, you know, without the, um, the, the Black Panther uniform, and even without the um, the sacred herb that he takes, um, the guy's just, you know, just absolutely the most deadly guy around. And it's more so because of um, what they're using up here and, you know, the the motivation and the, the, um, the strength of will that they have in their heart. Those are those are the things that um, that make them formidable. And I think what's missing in modern cinema and in, in modern uh, media, whether it's comics, whether it's movies, whether it's television, is that the writers um, are bringing in, you know, let's say they're trying to do a fin fatale. They do not understand that the st- true strength of a fin fatale or of a protagonist doesn't come from, you know, how many guns they can carry or, you know, um, how, how physically tough that they can be. That's not where the true strength and uh, being formidable comes from. That is a byproduct of strength, but the true strength of a character and the true, um, uh, the true thing that motivates and gets the character going and makes a winner that comes from strength of heart. And from once again, from that, from that tactical mindset and in modern cinema, again, I, I'm trying to think of it and I haven't seen it. I see them trying to use um, um, power projection as in physical power, hard power, like a masculine energy. Um, they understand how to use masculine energy. They, they understand how to um, have a protagonist, whether they're male or female, um, you know, go into a room and beat people up. Um, but as far as being a tactician, they do not, it, it, I, I, I have not seen it. I mean, it, I think you bring a valid point. Like the more, and I guess we'll just, I'll just, we'll theorize here. We'll just philosophize mm-hmm. a little bit. Sure. But what you're describing here with like having strong heart and a tactical mindset, um, how do I half joking but how do i turn that into a happy meal toy that kids are gonna see and get excited to play with without understanding like watching a three-hour movie and then at the end being like oh my god you know she was plotting this and when that happened it was because she did wow my mind's blown but that doesn't necessarily translate well to like a kung fu grip or like uh, like a spring loaded missile projection, you know, accessory on the toy. So right. I think, and, and, you know, we're talking toys, but you extrapolate that out to like, just go and bring the family out or go and go and see a movie with the friends. Sometimes I guess seeing Thor with a huge hammer and lightning shooting out and someone getting like thrown against the building and like cars <laughs> are flipping over the spectacle nature of it. Um, like does the, is there like <laughs> here hear me out yeah. is there a chance you can have that crazy over the top spectacle nature superhero movie and also be a film noir or would it have to be like a parody is it is it like that's too in your face um and that it requires like a, a lighter touch and more subtlety and more introspection or could are those two things congruent no a a good writer can do this um immediately what i thought of was um the black canary from from DC Comics, um, you know the uh, from the Justice League, um, Diana Prince is a absolute monster as far as being a um, um, as far as a martial artist. You said Black Canary. I'm not familiar with DC as much as anything else. You you usually see Black Canary associated with Green Arrow. Um, she's got the blonde wig. Um, she's always in like uh, fishnet stockings and boots and uh, like a leather jacket but as far as from a dc standpoint from dc canon she is one of the most efficient hand-to-hand combatants in the dc universe and the same thing with um another character in the dc universe is lady shiva lady shiva is you know black canary is like in like you know the, the top 10 but lady shiva is sitting 
either, depending on you know who's writing the story, she's either sitting at no, in the number one spot next to Richard Dragon, or she's been sitting in the number two spot with right along with Richard Dragon. Uh, these are two highly efficient characters um, that could carry a story, and they both think in a very tactical mindset, but they also have these fighting powers, or fighting prowess, <laughs> um, that would translate very well into, like, say, like a John Wick environment. Now, I would not necessarily put them in a film, I'm sorry, a film fatale category, maybe Lady Shiva, because Lady Shiva is, for the most part, a villain, but sometimes she has her soft spots. Um, a, a, a Lady Shiva movie would, would go over well, um, I think better than um, a, lot of, well, a lot of what I'm seeing now. Um, one thing that I would say, can, can, it, can there be a combination of the two? Yes, because I've seen it in a movie called um, Atomic Blonde. And I can't, I think that Charlie's was... Charlie's Theron, I think, right? Charlie's Theron, yes. If you look at Charlie's Theron, Atomic Blonde is what, to me, Atomic Blonde is what Black Widow should have been. Atomic Blonde was a, um, a, a spy thriller kind of set in the, the late 1980s. And Charlie's Theron is, I don't know if she works for the CIA or who she works for. But she goes in and she needs to find out. She's got a main mission. And then she's also, she wants to find out who killed her lover, who was also a spy. And she's doing, again, she's doing some John Wick level action in that movie. But she's also doing some, you know, some, some Gotham City style detective work. So you can marry the two. You can do that. Um, but again, she wasn't. In that film, she was not a femme fatale. She was, you know, she was a main action protagonist. But again, to me, Atomic Blonde, maybe throw in a few, I don't know, cyborg or something like that. That mm-hmm. should have been what uh, what black what the Black Widow movie turned out. What, what what we got from the Black Widow movie should have been Atomic Blonde. And from the another side of it, um, a couple of years ago, Robert Downey Jr. did a Sherlock Holmes movie, and um, it was the same thing. They showed Sherlock Holmes as the as a detective, being very observant and you know, having these strong situational awareness um, uh, skills. But they also showed him um, having these almost like <laughs> MMA <laughs> style, um, you know, fighting techniques. Uh, I, I, I think I wonder work. how much of that's because like, I understand it's a Sherlock Holmes movie, but also that's Iron Man. And it's like, you can't show Iron Man getting beat up and being this frail thing. I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe I'm just reading into that, but it almost feels like people go there and because it's Robert Downey Jr. It's like, we got to see him do like a, a, a rear naked choke on somebody. Like he's going to body yeah. slam somebody. Yeah, perhaps. And, uh, you know, that, 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 that could be, that, that I'm sure that plays into a lot of it also. Um, but there was also a German series. I believe it was a German series because I saw it and I, it was, it was definitely not a, uh, a USA production, but it was, it was based on the Sherlock Holmes myth, mythos and they did a similar thing. It was a very serious detective drama, but, um, the Watson character was, um, you know, a war vet from, um, I think maybe the, maybe the Afghanistan campaign, not, not the 2000s Afghanistan campaign campaign, but the, um, the late 1800s British, um, campaign. But, um, he had, you know, these, these combat skills and he came, excuse me, he came back to, to London and, started working with Holmes and, you know, kind of taught Holmes these, these combat type skills. And there was a combination of a, you know, a very serious detective story. And when the, when the situation called for it, there was, you know, there were these moments of intense action. So it is possible to do it, but I don't think, again, I don't think that modern writers have figured out 
the code yet. They haven't reverse engineered it yet, or at least they haven't made the connection in their minds yet to say that, hey, just like we did this with um, with Robert Downey Jr. and Sherlock Holmes, um, we can do this with, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where the, the hot, when I mean, when I say hot, I mean the, the current film actresses that can handle these, these physical roles, you know? I assume you like, like Brie Larson is the one they're throwing most of the Marvel movies at, for example, like the Marvels. Um, right. she's sort of like one of the, the, you know, she's the Hulk Hogan, I guess, in, in, yes. uh, in the current atmosphere of like comic book movies. Yes. They're, it looks like they're building, <clears throat> they're trying to build the, the franchise around, around her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when it, and if I know it's not possible entirely to like remove yourself from, uh, like, a sort of a favoritism towards noir and and maybe like batman-esque stories and everything so that don't don't have to like separate that from yourself and i'm curious are you a marvel guy or a dc guy if those are the only two options you're not allowed to look at dark horse or image or any other (laughs) things it's like marvel or dc have and you know are you are you one of the two right now and when you were growing up when you were younger were you one of the two um i think i would veer more toward the the Marvel side of things because, and that's because when I was growing up, I grew up in a very small town. And so there were a couple of places to, to get comics, but for some reason, I don't know, maybe for the just because of the distribution, I saw more Marvel comics than I saw of DC comics. Um, so, you know, I was, it was very easy for me to find a copy of Spider-Man or, um, you know, at that time, um, Luke Cage, Power Man, or, um, you know, Captain America, the Avengers or something like that. Those are very easy. And um, there was an old store uh, in town that sold, I don't know, almost like farm goods or like ranch goods. But for some reason, they had this old box of three or four old boxes of comics. And they were all Marvels. Whoever that collector was collected Marvel comics. Um, And so there were all these Marvel comics, especially like Thor, Copies of Thor from the 1960s, um, late, ni- late late 1960s and early 1970s, and so that's what I had. By, uh, that that was what that is what was accessible to me. So it gave me um, an affinity for the Marvel style of storytelling, and you know um, the art pacing. Is is there something that you can do to like quantify? the difference between Marvel and DC now in retrospect of all the comics you've read, is there like a, and you don't know, like, if there's not a great answer, you could just say yeah. no, but like, cause, cause I all go first. Like my example that might be very flawed, but it seemed that DC had these characters that they got their powers from unattainable sources. Their dad was a God or they came from another planet or whatever. So it was like, here's something that you could never be. And here's how they interact in a place that you are in. And then Marvel always felt like a normal person given these powers. So they fit, it felt more attainable, even though I might not jump into a vat of like toxic ooze and I might not want to have the military replace my skeleton with you know admantium and all that but it was like that was a normal person and i guess i felt a con- like a more of a connection between me and say wolverine than me and superman uh because like he's literally an alien so <laughs> do, is there any other way that like you uh kind of perceive marvel vs dc in, in similar ways you know and i i agree um that's very similar to to how i looked at it too in that the marvel heroes um, didn't seem to have that same cosmic level of power that the DC heroes had. So they were more relatable. And also the Marvel heroes had more relatable um, problems or situations, let's say situations and challenges. Once they were in their civilian identities, um, you know, Peter Parker had problems with his boss. Peter Parker was clearly a photographer. You know, growing up, I loved things like art and photography so I could relate to Peter Parker. I could relate to, um, you know, at that time, I guess he wasn't really, when I was reading, he wasn't really in high school. He was still, you know, going to um, college. But I could relate to um, him as far as his ideals, that he, the, uh, the ideals that he was expressing while he was in his Spider-Man persona. 
I could relate to what he was saying. And then I could relate to the situation that um, he was having as Peter Parker. And the same thing with even with someone say like, say like Daredevil, um, you know, those were things that, you know, even without the, you know, the radar sense that Daredevil has and, you know, things like that. It, it just felt like if you trained, if you trained your, your body, you know, you, from the physical side and you did everything that you could to, you know, on the inside to, to develop your sense of character, you could be Daredevil or you could be the Black Panther. You could be Captain America. Um, you know, now, you know, we think of Captain America as a super soldier guy, but there was a point in the 70s where, you know, Cap didn't have the super soldier uh, serum. He was, you know, just a regular guy with a whole lot of heart. And um, that really resonated with me. I don't even sure I even knew that. I just figured that Captain America always had the super serum and that's what made him Captain America. So there was a like a sober, there was a straight edge Captain America uh, before the super serum. Well, not, not before the super serum, but during the 70s, there was a storyline there. Um, it was it was very, very brief, maybe a, a year or so where he didn't have the serum. But even, you know, even depending on where you look at Cap throughout the, the entirety of his of his of his career, it's not the super soldier that makes him that makes him what he is. It's, it's, not, the, I'm sorry, it's, not the, it's not the super soldier serum. It's not the serum that makes Cap what he is. Um, with it or without it, he would still be the man that he is. Yeah, that's a great point because that the serum could be given to anyone. It doesn't just make you Captain America. You got to be Captain exactly. America first. And then that's like throwing a little bit of fuel onto the fire. So right. do you have a top three Marvel? Um, current Marvel, I'm not, I'm not really big on. Um, we'll just say forever, like even going back yeah. to the fifties and sixties, what, what's the top three, even if you have yeah. to qualify it with a genre like, or like a, <laughs> a period, right? <laughs> right. Um, I like, um, um, of course, Cap. I, I, I like Cap. I like what, I like what Captain America stands for. Um, people think that Captain America stands for the flag and that he stands for the government. No, that's not what Captain America stands for. He stands for the ideal um, he stands for the ideal of um, of freedom and freedom for everyone. So I, I like what he stands for. And he, you know, no matter what, he won't stop until he's he's done what he can for everyone. So caps my top. Um, for some reason, I I like Daredevil, <laughs> um, and I think that's because of the Frank Miller run. And there was. Um, for a brief moment in time, um, Howard Chaykin did a character called um, Dominic Fortune. And Dominic Fortune was kind of like a 1930s um, Indiana Jones kind of adventurer. And I really like the, the Dominic Fortune character. Again, I'm pulling this up because I'm not I'm not familiar at all. Yeah. The, um, that was a, a Chaykin character that he did. Um, oh, he's got the boots, man. The yes. <laughs> those Marvel boots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got the Buccaneer boots, and uh, I guess everyone did at one point. Everyone had to wear <laughs> yeah. those. Yeah, uh, that him, and um, and of course, you know, the, you know, I I, I love the I, I I love the the cin the cinema interpretation of the Black Panther, and I like what I'm not sure who did the maybe it was Christopher Priest did a run. But that was like back in the nineties or something like that. I've never even heard of the this series Sable and Fortune. It looks the covers look awesome. Yeah. So do you have a top three DC? Um DC, I like um I, I, I like the concept of of Green Lantern. Um, you know, the this whole cosmic the, the whole cosmic cop. Um, concept of Green Green Lantern, I like that. Um, both of them, the original Green Lantern, the the Alan Scott version, um, I think he had the most visual, the strongest visual appeal, and I think um, the, you know, the the later interpretation, the the Gil Kane interpretation of Hal Jordan um, as Green Lantern, and you know the Green Lantern Corps, 
Um, I really connect with them. And also, um, um, I like the question. Uh, the question had an v- outstanding run. Again, I believe that was the 90s and early 2000s with Denny O'Neill and Dennis Cowan um, at the helm of those. And they took it, they really, they, they, they really um, leaned forward into that whole Zen aspect of the question and, you know, bringing in these elements of Sun Tzu and things like that. So, and also they were bringing in, La- in Lady Shiva uh, into that series. So the question and probably if I had to pick a third one, it would probably be, um, yeah, Green Green Lantern, um, the question, and yeah, the rest of DC is kind of kind of. <laughs> I, I don't think really. I don't think it's really written for me. <laughs> I mean, we're, we are uh, alike in that way, but I also always wonder, was it just because of accessibility, like first off, um, and then it followed that I was like, no, I relate more to Marvel. I don't know, yeah. maybe, <laughs> but uh, yeah, dude, Mar- Marvel was always kind of cool. So, okay. So if, if we were to take a step back and you can expand your horizons outside of just Marvel and DC, maybe yeah. that includes imprints and stuff. Do you have any uh, like publishers or, you know, imprints that like if they come out with something new, you're automatically interested just because they tend to put out stuff that you really like. Love and Rockets, the Hernandez brothers. If if I see a Love and Rockets, if I see something from the Hernandez brothers, um, especially Jaime, um, if I see Love and Rockets, I pick it up. I don't, you know, I don't flip through it to to see how it seems what the story's like or anything like that. That's that's an immediate buy for me. Um, a lot of the um, Mike Mignola stuff with Hellboy. If Mike mm-hmm. Mignola's doing Hellboy, that's usually um, an automatic buy for me. And um, and again, you know, stuff like Will Eisner. Um, if I see a, a, a Will Eisner artist book, I'm picking that up. If I see something with um, uh, he did Terry and the Pirates. Uh, I can't believe I'm I'm blanking on his name, but he did Terry and the Pirates. He did Steve Canyon. Um, oh man, I'm blanking on his name. Um, but that creator, if I see something from him, I'll pick them up. Pick Mil- up. Milton Caniff. Yes, yeah, the- Mil- Milton Caniff. Yeah, yeah. If I see Caniff, if I see Caniff, if I see Will Eisner, if I see Alex Raymond, who did um um. Flash Gordon and Rip Kirby, I'll pick those up. Uh, but th- again, that's not that's not current stuff. From a, yeah, I was going to say you might not find anything new by Can if yeah, uh, or, if, or, if you're or looking I, out for it, you might be disappointed. Right, but it, we, but if I see like an art book from them, something like that, or you know Alex Alex Tilton, some of those guys, because they understood they understood storytelling, they understood pacing. Um, you know, they understood the visual aspects of, of, of the of the um, of the signature narrative. They understood the physical aspect, and they understood the the dialect of it. And, and I, I don't know. I, like I say, the the I, I don't see it in in modern storytelling. I'm sorry. I, it, it pains me to say that, uh, but I, I don't see it. Could this possibly be like an OK Boomer type of thing where it's like the new generation just doesn't want femme fatales? They don't want to see Lauren Bacall slapped. If anything, they want to see Lauren Bacall do the slapping as like a like a power inversion. Do you do you think that like there's just no interest or do you think it's just that like people uh, have lost the way? And if they only saw really good noir or really good storytelling, it would latch them. Or is it just, you know bygone era boomer boomers clasping onto what they liked i say that in jest but i'm not calling you a boomer but that's what right. would, that's what the response would be on like the comments i assume I, I i understand that but i i think um i think there are i think there's an attempt to 
to blaze new paths. And I understand that we all do it. We all try to blaze new paths and try to break away from the past. That is understandable. But there are also some foundations that we have to be able to acknowledge. Um, it's like looking at the looking back at Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Joseph Campbell's um, the hero with a thousand faces is a is a book a, des, a, a book a, a, a testimony from a documentary uh, or a documentation of the the baseline foundations that connect heroes um, across uh, just 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 across the, the human spectrum of the qualities of the hero's arc, the journey of a hero. And I've had people tell me that, well, they don't want to read that because they don't want to be held down by, by the past. You know, they want to blaze new trails. They want to do things their own. Well, that's fine. But things like, say, like the hero's, uh, the hero of the thousand pieces of the hero's journey, that's your foundation. That, that's, that's the, 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 the building blocks um, that are, you know, that are, that are peer reviewed and, and, and peer proven to be the building blocks. It doesn't mean that you have to follow that to the T, but as a creator, you need to understand that here are the, here are the building blocks of the structure of, of a hero's journey. This is what happens in across nearly every culture, the faces may change, the the environments may change, but there are um, there are definite story key points that need to happen at specific times in order for a narrative to be successful. And if I can go back for a moment, it has nothing to do, my my example had nothing to do with um any actions that were taken against Lauren Bacall in that movie, my act, my the reason I brought that up, the reason I mentioned that was to denote that he was an individual that, on the outside, if an act of violence was going to be committed against him, you would think that they would cower away or 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 go away and go into a corner and cry somewhere, but in her in her case, she did not. She was able to take that, you know, this this act of violence, and still maintain whatever goals that she had to do, and do them very effectively. Well, I, I guess the the point there being the reason that that scene stands out is because it's a subversion of your expectations, right? You expect to see the dainty, uh, attractive woman right. cower or crumple, and the fact right. that she doesn't—that's the subversion. And I guess maybe the 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 inversion here now in like modern yeah. cinema where instead of you being surprised by that, now it's like, well, we're going to surprise them by having the girl walk up to Thor and just slap him across the face. And you know that I, I guess sure. But at this point you almost expect that you go to the movie and you're like, Oh, of course we're going to see, you know, um, Miss Marvel, like, punched the Hulk and Hulk's going to go flying or like something right. like that. And so now the, the subversion of your expectation is not met because you were expecting it and then it meets it. Um, and I guess to some people that might actually kind of, that's like the song that you can sing along to, right? Some people only want to hear the songs that have been in their playlist for 20 years because they get a different type of satisfaction from knowing every word that's about to come up and being able to sing along with it. Versus some people that might be really interested in new music and listening to new genres constantly and not being able to sing along. I don't know. There maybe it's like the line in the sand there. Yeah, and um, and and, and I, I I definitely agree with you with that. Um, it's just that I have concerns when I hear or when I'm presented with a retort that um, understanding the basics of say things like storytelling or music are seen as um, and, and it's trying to hold on to the past when you no, know, it's just trying to. It, it's 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 just under it's um, just a basic understanding of pure math. Um, it's it's like denying math. Um, if someone says that they 
don't have a taste for modern music. Well, maybe that's a genre thing, or maybe it's because there's certain things in music, your circle of fifths, <laughs> um, you know, again, circle of fifths is a peer reviewed <laughs> uh, method, methodology of how music is structured. And so for a modern musician to say, hey, I'm going to make music and I don't I don't want to I don't want to learn about the the foundations. I don't want to learn about the circle of fifths thing. Well, yeah, go ahead and give it a shot. And what you come up with may indeed be quite creative, but you would be a lot, you would go a lot farther if you took five minutes to sit down and look at the circle of fifths to see how musical notes have a relationship and you know just the basic elements of a one four five progression just just look at those things and then understand those basic concepts and work forward from there because that work's already been done it's like saying i want to be a scientist but you know i don't want to read about this isaac newton guy i don't want to read about this this nikola tesla guy i don't want to read that stuff i don't want to go out and and, and find my own answers. Well, okay, yeah, you're going to be able to do it. You're going to find some answers and you're going to find them in your own way. But guess what? A lot of that groundwork has been done and it just ends up being reinventing the wheel. And so that's a lot of, that's a lot of creative time that is being spent where, you know, this creator could have been creating something, a total, pa- a complete package if they already, if they basic, if they already under knew these, if they already understood these basic concepts, it does not mean holding tight to the past and 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 just re- regurgitating and retelling those same old stories or re-singing those same old songs. But you have to have a basic understanding of the foundations. As an artist, it is important to look at um, to look at. The classic, the classical artists, say like Michelangelo is looking at, um, you know, just pick up a George Bridgman's book. You can go to any half price bookstore or go on Amazon and get George Bridgman's um, anatomy book. Pick it up and look at how musculature um, looks underneath the skin. How you know how the 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 um, the body is is structured into stacks that doesn't mean that it's, it's hampering creativity. That doesn't mean that it's not, it, 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 that you can't move forward and blaze new trails, but you have to understand the basics. You have to have a basic foundation before blazing new trails. Otherwise you're going to blaze new trails and then you're going to crash and burn. Yeah. And, and uh, it, that's a, such a good example out of like a very practical one is understanding human anatomy. And that's another thing that like even self-taught artists, uh, after you've worked with like many, many artists, like hundreds and hundreds of artists over the years, at least for me, it's, you can usually tell someone that understands anatomy and then is breaking the rules of anatomy to like overemphasize certain things. Uh, and then someone that just maybe was never interested in it. Um, and then just draws things on how they imagine the body kind of works without like really studying it. And it, if there's one tip for an artist that draws people, I guess in particular, but if you start to understand those muscle groups, if you can just remember what they're called by the time you remember what they're called, you'll be able to draw the human figure better because you kind of understand like where they're at and, and uh, how they react and how it stretches skin and adjusts the proportions and all this. But so I've got a strained analogy here. I hope, I hope it holds up uh, th- from my head into formulating words and everything. And just to be clear, these are my words, not yours. So if, if I get some of this analogy wrong, but it, it almost, as you're describing this, uh, I'm thinking of like the conspiracy community, which I've got one foot in comics and one foot kind of in conspiracy. These are like the two worlds that I live in. Uh-huh. And as you describe that of like this, this whole thing of like, you don't have to reinvent the wheel just because you disagree with some facet of the system. Sure. Maybe you right. hate the concept of an 18 wheeler, but that doesn't mean like start from scratch, you know, <laughs> like, like exactly. forget the wheel. Maybe we make a star shaped wheel. Like, I don't know. Maybe the wheel's a good start. And then you figure, 
figure out some of the other. So in, in the conspiracy world, as you're describing, don't start over from scratch. And if you're interested in physics, you know, maybe look at Isaac Newton. Well, there there is some propensity in the in the conspiracy community where it's like everyone has always lied to us, even books, even schools. So maybe there was no Isaac Asimov. Maybe there was no Isaac Newton. Maybe there was no Copernicus. Maybe all this is completely fabricated and fake. Uh, and I guess in particular, it's like, uh, some people that are in like the flat earth community tend to point at that and say, well, of course you can disprove it. If you use all these made up words and terms and science and people that never existed, don't bring up Copernicus. He was invented by the church or whatever. Right. right. And uh, we won't have to go into these minute details, but the end result is that there's like an, a wave of people where they're like, well, I need to build my entire theory of reality and politics and just assemble the world in front of me but also not stand on the shoulders of anything that's ever been done before like so forget socrates forget aristotle they didn't even exist nobody existed before the year 1800 and and in my the way that you just described it i love where it's like you can do that if you want to step back and you want to say like i'm going to invent rubber from scratch all over and form it into a wheel that's great and then maybe in 40 50 years you might have a tire that's usable but meanwhile you've taken all that time and energy that could have been just used directly for creativity and something that you haven't done before and no one else has done before at the sacrifice of maybe not understanding the full building blocks but there's like this weird dichotomy here too uh, where it's like if you want to be a trailblazer it's like yeah but you got to be a trailblazer later first you got to focus on the basics and the fundamentals and learn what your great 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 grandpappy had to learn and then you can be the trailblazer so maybe well, there's also a little bit of instant gratification in between those two but the the, the strained analogy i was going to make is that in that in that, that conspiracy world in particular where it's like they want to make the new research that no one's ever done. I'm breaking new ground and I'm thinking of things in a brand new light. It almost seems like the new what you'd call it, the, the woke mass media, where it's like we're going to take all of these established franchises and flip them on their head and do all this stuff because we disagree with whatever imperialism or fill in the blank ism and it's like they're both they're both doing the same thing but maybe in like different directions and they both think that they're on opposite ends of the spectrum but it's the same thing it's like if you just ignore everything that came before you uh to like what is it cut your cut your nose off to spite your face it's a little bit of that it feels like yes i agree um and on the one hand i understand where it comes from you know, I, I, I understand where that motivation comes from. And in, in some way, I do support it because, you know, that's, that's what artists do. We try to blaze new trails. But I also kind of point back and say, hey, yeah, we can, we can blaze new trails, but we, we, we have to see how the fire started. <laughs> how much do you think this is, let's just, in a very broad sense, without putting an, a name or, an, or anything on it, but like the difference, the Delta between like that classic noir that you love and maybe modern movies or the classic comics that you like, and maybe modern comics. Um, like what would, what do you think would be the main difference between these two things? So like this new generation that's coming and writing this, do you think that it's coming from the artists or do you think it's coming from the corporations or do you think it's a blend of the two? Like, would you, if there's a needle, is it like more in the artist column? It's like, Oh, it's the artists and the writers that are coming up from a new generation. Or do you think like maybe there's influence from the top down where it's like, no shape this character like this, like who's, who's driving the car. Um, you know, that's, that's a tough call. I'm not sure. I definitely know that, um, if, if the corporation, if the corporation wasn't, wasn't on board with it, then, you know, they're the ones that are making, making the decisions on who's being hired. And so depending on, you know, who you hire and, you know, the, the agenda that's set, set forth by, you know, the, the, the mission statement of the, whatever the project is, you hire folks that can, you know, that can be on board with the mission statement of the project. No, another maybe strained analogy, but like research grants, right? It's like, 
50 people can research one thing, but if your research tends to align with what I want your research to say, then I might fund your project out of the hundred others that are out there. And it doesn't necessarily mean that your research is more accurate or better. It just means that it was aligned with someone that was cutting checks that day. Maybe. Yeah. And um, again, you know, it all depends on, on, on what's passing the, the peer reviewed, um, the peer reviewed criteria, but yeah, it all depends on who's doing the hiring and, and what their, what their mission goals are. When it comes to music, cause you're also really big into music and on, we probably won't even be able to get it. I was be like, get at your guitar. Let's just do like a quick little freestyle session. But yeah. have you ever heard of this debate between 440 Hertz versus 432 Hertz? Have you ever heard of this before? Yeah, it's that change between the the tonal frequencies. So, what are we now? They're they're doing four forty now. Is that correct? Yeah, ever ever since the nineteen twenties, I believe they standardized it to be four forty, and that's the standard what you would call orchestral tuning, I believe. So now worldwide, no matter what you know, Philharmonic or venue you go in, you could more or less expect the orchestra to be tuned at four forty for convenience because they didn't back in the day if you went to vienna to you know um prague to munich you didn't want to like have to train your voice for 440 and then 432 and then go back to 440 so this yeah. was one of the the reasons behind that yeah and 442 is supposed to be more har- harmonious with the whatever the schumann waves are or Exactly, because it's divisible by eight and the Schumann resonance, I think, is eight hertz. And I, yeah. I think that's some of the math. I'm not big on the math part. Yeah. So so you've heard about this before. How much credit do you give this? Is it just like a like a like a fleeting funny thought? Or do you think that there's something to that? You know, I don't know whether it's anything nefarious or not, but I definitely I, I think that it's been proven that, you know, we all resonate to certain sound frequencies. Um, you know, there's that whole um, that whole thing of, um, not a Brahma, the world is sound. Um, you know, there's one of the other, you know, the other legends is, um, first it was the voice or first it was first the voice spoke and then everything was created after that. But, and that's, you know, that's just looking at the, the, the mythology of things, but from, from the scientifically proven aspects of things. Yeah. We all have a certain frequency that we resonate with. And apparently, you know, we resonate better with the 442 Hertz. Um, I haven't done any, any in-depth research on that, but that's just, you know, my, the, the basics that I have of it. And I think if, I think that's, if you tune down, if you tune your guitar down to like, open D or D that puts you in that 442 range. I think so. And I don't remember. Uh, so you're talking about like the, the drop D tuning, but really if, if you were, yeah. so if, if you were comparing 432 to 440, you, what you would do is first you would um, tune your a to 432 Hertz instead mm-hmm. of 440. And then whenever you drop your D down, that D would still be dropping within the, the context of 432 or 440. So it's like once you set into 432 and you tune that A and everything gets tuned around that A, now everything is technically, and that's where it gets a little bit weird because it's like the the frequency of the D isn't 432 or 440 because that's the A. So it's clearly going to be different. So at that point, like even though the A might be divisible by eight versus 10, once you get to like different notes, like those notes aren't necessarily divisible by eight or 10. I don't know. Um, it's a fascinating topic to me just because yeah. lots of people with lots of time and money and power and even those that don't have been fascinated with it and obsessed with it. Uh, and even there was like a worldwide, you know, like movement to consolidate it into that standard. And the, the weirdest thing is that it was against the wishes of opera singers worldwide. I believe any vocalists were against 440 because in order to tune the human voice to 440, it causes more like abrasiveness just from the sound waves hitting versus 432. I don't know why one won out over the other. This is where it gets into like the fun conspiracy discussions because some people are like, they're trying to, you know, enslave humanity. So of course they switch it to 440. I don't know. (laughs) 
Well, I, I also think that, um, again, I, I, I tend to see both sides of, of, of a situation in that I can understand the need to have a have some conformity to, you know, a worldwide standard. So I can understand that. Um, but I also look at the other side where, OK, so I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the reasoning was to, of choosing the, the 442 especially if it's a, uh, 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 a a frequency that doesn't resonate in harmony with, you know, with the environment or with, with humans. I, 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 I think it was between vocalists and um, those that played instruments. It was like, it's easier to tune our instruments to this number. So just deal with it. Yeah. You get a sore yeah. throat. Oh, well, like we've got a hundred instruments here. You've got one voice. So maybe yeah. it was just like a numbers thing. It's hard. It's hard to tell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As opposed to something, um, you know, some, some nefarious mastermind plan of, there was a huge movement that, that I think peaked in the late eighties or nineties by a really odd political guy, Lyndon LaRoche. Um, but he was like, he spearheaded this movement to try and convert the world back to 432, uh, mm -hmm. over 44. It was unsuccessful, but he got incredibly popular with opera singers for a small amount of time because again, they were like, yes, please. We've been waiting for this for, you know, 60 plus years, but yeah, it, it didn't work <laughs> because it's, I don't know. It's such a weird thing. Like how many people are really going to be passionate over like retuning instruments worldwide and in right. the process of that invalidating the, the tonal consistency of the last, like, you know, five to six decades of music. And it, it's weird. It's like sunken cost fallacy, uh, at the level of like a worldwide, you know, industry of music that everyone's in on because everyone's got something at stake. It's weird. Right. Right. So, well, that, that was a good little introduction to, uh, some, some weird sort of paranormal S questions. Yeah. I got a few more. I'm going to throw at you, uh, sure. without completely blindsiding you. I've got some rules and uh, before I play a little fun, little intro, but basically the rules, I'm just going to mention a concept of some kind, like before I brought up flat earth, for example. So if I say okay. flat earth, you're just going to rate zero to 10, zero being you give it no credibility and then 10 being like, yeah, I'm already on the bus. Get on with me. Okay. Enough sense. Okay. All right, here we go. Hey, conspiracy buffs. I double dare you to take some PCP, the paranormal conspiracy probe on your marks, get set and go. All right. Question one, Robert, are you a cop? Cause if you're a cop, you have to tell me right now. That's how this works. <laughs> I'm not a cop. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't ever believe anyone. Even when they say no, I, I understand you're allowed to lie to me and to build the case, whatever. I know you're taking notes. Okay. Well, let's just start out on the example. Flat earth, zero to 10. Maybe a three. Little gray men, aliens with the, the big eyes and not metaphorical, like an actual biological gray alien on the planet earth. Oh, uh, then we're we're going up in the sevens and eights there. Okay, reptilian shape shifting aliens, a la V, or you know, take your pick. Same, same. Seven, ten. No, I'm sorry, seven or eight. Uh, how about ghosts? Like a legitimate haunted house with a ghost that can materialize and you can see it. Um, four. How about a demon, even if it's like a metaphorical poltergeisty one, but like, let's, you know, could, could you run a seance and summon a demon? Like a Christian demon? I guess, or and take your pick. The, you can take a, a Greek daemon if you want, <laughs> you know, King Solomon with his sigils summoning demons that do his laundry. I don't know what he was using them for, but yeah. Um, basically it's it's some sort of like a real entity an objectively real entity but it doesn't necessarily need a physical form and i guess if if you don't want to classify it as christian it doesn't have to be good or bad it can be you know a jinn i guess yeah um depending on the context or dinosaurs dinosaurs 10 dinosaurs 10 dragons with the caveat that they are br they are flying and fire breathing dragons oh 
or superpowers a human with actual superpowers now that can be lev- levitation uh it can mean flying shooting lasers breathing underwater for hours at a time it can't mean like chris angel uh and it can't mean you know like you know your role your role model that lifted a car under uh you know a significant fight or flight spike of adrenaline like legitimate superpowers i would say around eight we're gonna we're gonna go back on some of these, by the way, too. Yeah. Um, and then Hollow Earth. Um, then I'm going to go eight to nine. Human beings landed on the moon in the 1960s. Um, I would say ten. I believe that happened. How about uh, what was it? India. India just landed on the moon, right? Like right. this year. Mm-hmm. Zero to ten on that. I would say ten. All right, I want to. I want to walk back because you can. You're off the hot seat now. Okay. And we said eight on superpowers. So yeah. I just want to hear like what when I said that. What's what's going through your mind that you're like, oh yeah, eight because of this way that I just thought about it. Um, I would say eight because I'm thinking of like the, you know, like the Shaolin monks or. Okay. The yogis, the yogis that um, that meditate for you know years, and they can you know do like the astral projections or just kind of put their bodies into a different state. That's a great example, having like full control. And I I know I've seen some of the the, the weirdest ones where the guys that could go out in the snow and decide if they wanted to like melt all the snow around them or not, and they could regulate their body heat to different ways. Yeah. I've also got a really good friend. Shout out to to Juan uh, Juan Ayala of the One on One podcast, but he's obsessed with this uh, self mummification ritual that some of these like really high level monks would get into. I don't know if you've ever heard of this before. If not, this is this is absolutely wild. Here, I'll have to I'll have to pull it up a, a visual while we talk about this. Um, but there's there's a very uh, specific name for it. And uh, if you're eating lunch or whatever, just maybe hold off this. It won't be. I don't think it's censorable, but it's I don't know. To me, it's not pleasant looking. But basically, there's these monks that they start to adhere to a very specific and strict diet uh, of food. And it's called there's a there's a more specific name than just self mummification. But um, essentially, this is what happens this is the end result. Oh, here we go. So Soka Shinbutsu. I'm butchering that beyond uh, words, but what they do is they slowly change their diet and they will basically mummify from the inside to the out. And if it's done successfully, then their body can remain completely preserved indefinitely essentially but if they screw up even a little bit uh then their body succumbs to just the normal process of decay so it's like all that work for nothing and you still die from it so anyways i would okay maybe this isn't the most uh uh, biggest flex of a superpower of like i can go and mummify myself but the amount of i guess heart like that captain america style heart of like Everything my body's telling me is that like I'm killing, you know, I'm, I'm hurting myself, but it, they still go through it because they believe that I think this frees them from like the karmic cycle uh, because they're not like giving anything to be reborn again. Like they're just preserving themselves uh, in place. But anyways, yeah, you brought you brought up the Shaolin monks and like the superpowers. Yeah, I 100 percent believe you. And in fact, I might have been like a five before and maybe now I'm a six because that's a great <laughs> example, man. Do you have a favorite Wu Tang uh, persona within the the thirty six chambers? I do not. You know, are you a Wu Tang fan at all? Um, not really. Uh, on the I, I had to ask just because you brought Shaolin uh, Shaolin <laughs> Monk up at the very beginning as as your example. So yeah, <laughs> I was thinking maybe like Bobby Digital or something. I don't know. <laughs> so um, I'm also curious too because I brought up dragons and dinosaurs and i and i know when i said dinosaurs you're like wait what do you mean dinosaurs yeah of course 10 well 
there's a an interesting theme that uh, there's more people than not will tend to say zero for dinosaurs or they will give like a five for dinosaurs and like a 10 for dragons and you're and you maybe you're wondering like why well it goes into this same aspect of like everybody in history has been lying to us although in the defense of people that deny dinosaurs, if you look into the research and the like the original OGs in the late 1800s that were starting to find all these like fossilized records and putting together, they kind of even admit in their own personal notes that they were just sort of like, take one of those and put it with one of those and we'll call it this. And if, you know, if it looks unique enough, we can sell it to that museum as a, this thing. And then we can take the same bones, but can, it was like Taco Bell, um, of like fossils, right? Like you just arrange the same things in eight different ways and call it different stuff and charge different stuff. That's the oversimplified version of why some people say dinosaurs are fake because they they believe that those bones might be from something that's completely unrelated to the dinosaur and it was just sold to the museum. That's the devil's advocate explanation of it. So anyways, I, I'm curious on di- or, uh, dragons. I understand believing in dinosaurs. I also believe in dinosaurs. I don't know if I'm a 10. I'm probably like a 9.9. 9. Um, but when, when it comes to dragons, I feel like I slide way back down to like a one or maybe even like a zero point something. Yeah. Uh, so it's fascinating to just talk about dragons a little bit. So let me let me hear it. Um, just so because I again, I, I try to keep an open mind about everything. Um you know, there's so many things that we have discovered as humans, and then there's so many things that we have not. And there's just so many options and, I don't know, so many ways for um, life to exist. And, you know, I like to keep my options open. And this is just a question that comes up often. So this is more devil's advocate than anything. But why do you think that there are so many historical stories of dragons, but none at all of dinosaurs? You know, I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, maybe it's just terminology. Maybe that's what they called them. Uh, maybe when they found the dinosaurs' bones, they didn't have the concept um, or the, the resources and like I say, the situational awareness to conceptualize it in the way then to say that it was something, um, you know, supernatural or something like a dragon. Are there any sort of supernatural or spiritual stories that you give um, more credit to than others? I'm not asking you to pick a winner of world religions, by the way. I just mean, mm-hmm. like, is there is there a specific story that resonated with you more than in others? Um. Not really. Like I say, I, I try to keep an open mind with everything. So if I if I hear a story or um, you know read something, I, I try to keep an open mind about what as best as I can. I try to put myself into that context of the of that time of that time, you know, the physical time and what the people were seeing around them and how they were using that to shape what they were seeing or what they were being exposed to. And I, I want to wrap this up a little bit, but also like open a brand new can of worms that shouldn't be the last question, but let's just, just, just do it anyways. But how are your thoughts on AI, man? What do you, do you see AI as a net positive and net negative? Uh, do you, does it leave a bad taste in your mouth? Does it make you, you know, more optimistic for the future? What, what comes to mind? I think AI is inevitable. I think AI is the future of what we're going to become. Um, at some point, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to do away with with you know, the heavily the phone as a separate physical thing. Um, at some point, we're going to have these phones and our technology is going to be integrated within us, uh, whether it's. You know, in the beginning, like, um, what's the thing that uh, Musk is doing, the, the neural link? Mm-hmm. It'll probably start with things like the neural link, and then, I don't know, maybe nanobots that we consume, and then point, there'll be a fusion between, um, you know, the human experience and the AI experience. We will have to do it in order to survive, um, because right now we can kind of keep up with our our laptops and our PCs and our iPads as far as the amount of information that 
that um, that is being transferred. But once we start getting to, you know, trying to transfer terabytes and, you know, uh, that level of, of information transfer, it's just faster to have the technology or to be part of the technology as opposed to interacting with the technology. It's faster to be part of the technology. Uh, so I think that at some point in the future, AI will just be will, will just be humankind. That's that will, that's what humans will be. So let's say Neuralink rolls out. There's no major reported deaths or weird adverse reactions. Like it's pretty much smooth sailing. And you get a message from Elon Musk himself, Robert Stewart. Congratulations, you've won an all expenses paid Neuralink surgery. Do you book that appointment, or do you say that's for the next generation, not me? Uh, no. I, I, I'm, uh, when it comes to, to things like that, I I tend to, you know, as we were talking about music earlier and, you know, guitars and things like that, I, I'm not a solid state guy. I'm a, I, I like <laughs> tube amps. And <laughs> okay, let's uh, say that they, they're going to install a vacuum tube version of a <laughs> Neuralink in your head then. Maybe some Nixie tubes or something. No, it's <laughs> no, it's because, still a, still a hard no. <laughs> yeah, because it's, because once once you go down that route, the 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 game has totally changed. Because what um, there's there's no more secrets, there's no more individuality. Um, it becomes a hive mentality because then everyone is connected, is truly connected. Um, which in some ways that's in some that's probably like the 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 ultimate expression of existence you know that's that's existence in its highest form um we're, we're talking you know what was the thing that um captain marvel the the, the original Cree captain marvel had you know um, cosmic awareness that's the that's the ultimate but also you, you lose whatever individuality that you have in that. That's the cost of it. When I guess there's also some sort of like a quantization that's happening at some level. So even if you get, I wonder what that would be. And I'm just thinking out loud here, not even as a, a question necessarily, but like the same concept of an of a uncanny valley is when the resolution or the fidelity of a certain thing looks so damn close to real that your brain only focuses on the tiny little parts that make it not real. So it's almost like the same thing. If I can express to you every thought I've ever had, uh, within the span of a few minutes, because I can just do this like neural uplink that's like terabytes in bandwidth. And I don't have to sit here and spell it out and draw pictures. Right. I can just be like, uh -huh. here's everything I've ever thought, bam, and you've got it all. Um, but I wonder like how much of that comes across accurately, not just in the, sh this short burst in this new way, but also just that quantization when the, the computer decided to round a, a 0.49 to a five in one of those calculations, Maybe all of a sudden you think I like vanilla ice cream instead of chocolate because something got rounded in like the rounding errors. I don't know. Right. And I think, you know what? I, I, I think at that point, it doesn't matter because that's become the new norm. Whatever those inconsistencies, inconsistencies are there between that, that data transfer, that's become the norm. Um, that will be... <laughs> yeah. You're right. I, I guess I don't like chocolate. I do like vanilla. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we all agree. We all agree. I like vanilla now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I can, I can see a different generation, maybe not me, but I can see a generation growing up and saying like, Oh no, I'd prefer that. That sounds way better than like, I've got to make my own decisions and try and fit in. Or we, we all just wear the same thing. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, also, okay. One other thing on that is that once you get to that point, to the to the ultimate level, that time doesn't exist anymore because, as you say, everything is instantaneous. If everything is instantaneous, then there's no passage of time. So again, it's the it's the ultimate form of existence. 
Well, I, I guess so. The, the the time in that case, because time now is scientifically right. The atomic clock, it's based on the decay of radioactive material, I think, like some kind of a half life. <laughs> But in this case, the time then would just be how long will your biological shell allow you to stay in this timeless existence? So then it's just like you're checking your your health meter becomes the time meter. It's like right. how much how much more can my biological suit oxidize until it completely decays and there's nothing left to oxidize? Exactly. So, well, this has been uh, just you know, butterflies and rainbows. And you know, I, I like how it, it got steered into transhumanism. What a, a cool topic. We started on classic film noir and femme fatales and made our way to how AI is going to destroy us all and, and enslave humanity in the next, what, two years. How long do you give us by the way, until the neural link maybe becomes the norm? Do you, are you thinking in terms of decades or centuries or not even? Oh, it's, it's going to be a couple of decades because it's got to be, you know, it's, it, there, there's going to be people on both sides of the fence. The that that ultimate form of AI human uh, human integration that's going to be thousands of years. Well, yeah. When when are they gonna when are they gonna make the final iPhone that's just perfect and mm-hmm. never needs another update? Right. That's yeah. that's when the integration fully happens. There'll, there'll never be a case. Someone will always have the later upgrade. That, I think that'll be scary is when the the dynamics between, oh, you've got the new Jordans or, oh, you've got the new iPhone is now like, oh, your brain is faster than mine. Like it, right. it takes that competition to an entirely different level where it really does mean you might get a better job or you might come out on top because you literally upgraded your brain, you know? <laughs> right. So, all right, well, I'll see you in the surgery room later when we get our neural links. Uh, I know you were just saying you wouldn't get one, but we were, we're both getting them. So, Robert, once again, tell people where they can find you and your work and Afterburner Comics. Are there any local shops in your area that you want to send people to? Yes, absolutely. So online, you can find me at afterburnercomics.com. And um, I'm really active on social media with my Instagram account. So uh, check me out at Afterburner Comics. Uh, on Instagram and um, locally uh, I'm here in the San Francisco Bay area um, uh, flying colors, comics and other cool stuff uh, in Concord, California, Dr. Comics and Mr. Games in Oakland comics experience in San Francisco, fantastic comics in Berkeley, uh, space cat comics in uh, San Jose, California uh, comics and collectibles in Sacramento and least I forget uh, Zeppelin Comics over in Benicia, California, and Waterford Comics over in Sassoon, California. So check those guys out. Um, they've all been very helpful to me in promoting the Afterburner brand, and just as a um, you know, as a as an indie creator and publisher. That's awesome. A double shout out. I'll go ahead and I'll look up all of those comic shops and I'll link them all below because I've got nothing but absolutely unbridled unconditional love in my heart for small comic shops that carry indie books it's not the norm anyone that's tried to publish a comic book and has done the cold calling and knocking on doors very often they'll just be like we don't have the real estate like what am i going to do to put it on in front of the superman book yeah get out of here um that i'm paraphrasing that's not an exact conversation but it's kind of the gist so anytime there's a comic shop that is willing to give shelf space to indie comics thank you so much um they're what makes the industry in my opinion still interesting if everything was just a marvel or a dc comic uh, I don't know how long it can sustain itself. Maybe indefinitely. Who knows? But I don't read those kinds of books. I read stuff like Afterburner. I read stuff that like Robert's putting out. So go and check those out at his website. And while you're at it, go and buy one of these two. Dive into a realm where comedy meets cosmic adventure. Chaos Twins, created by comedian Sam Tripoli and comic publisher Paranoid American, will sweep you off your feet. Join two girls with the astonishing ability to morph into animals, rally with their cryptid crew, and traverse diverse dimensions. But you don't have to take my word for it. Sign up now at chaostwins.com. 
In a place as curious as Crown City, adventure awaits at every turn. Meet Anna and Becca, two spirited souls navigating a world filled with wonders and weirdness. Alongside their trusted allies, Biggie, Mathilda, and the Chupacabros, they'll stand against aliens, reptilians, and mysteries beyond imagination. Dive into their captivating tales and discover a world where anything is possible. For more information, visit chaostwins.com, samtripoli.com, and paranoidamerican.com. 